they, we have them sort of scheduled for a Q and A slash fireside chat. I have questions ready to go, but I actually wanted to take it out to the audience first because it's such a big issue. Um, obviously, one of the hardest things is that when you have a place even like Sonoma County, we're already rebuilt. So getting people to just re you know readapt to what that is, and when uh, Michael Newman was here maybe two months ago, and he was driving around, he's general counsel for IBHS, and he said to me. Wow, Jen, you are not wildfire prepared here. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's, you know, we built back, you know, we were the, kind of the first out the gate and we, we just built back really fast, but we definitely did not build back really safe. So that's a hard thing for people to adapt. Also to not have things like, it's hard to get people to take juniper out of their yards right up against their house, even if the next house right next door to them burned down. That's how, that's so, that's some of the challenges. And then one of the things I love um, about having this combination up here is it's all of the science, but then there's the adaptation of it too. So I would like to take it out to you first to the audience. Did you have a question? Can I start? I'll start right here. Team Rubicon. Okay. Thank you for, <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. I love seeing the stats when they work. But I, I live in Sonoma where we have 80 mile an hour red flags with wooey houses catching fire just as quickly with all the above mentioned. Uh, there is that reality here. Um, when you, that's how you melt metal, you know, that, so there's no such thing as a fire proofed home. I am concerned that there is no discussion about dynamic, such as like flooding your roof during a, a fire and such like that. Uh, has there been like next level preparation for homes which are in this high vulnerability area? Yeah, so the, the way we think about it is you've got uh, three, three types of ignition, right? So you've either got embers, you've got radiant heat, and you've got direct heat. The wildfire prepared home base program is designed to protect against embers and plus protect against radiant and direct heat. If a, if a partially mitigated, so a wildfire prepared home base that has combustible siding experiences direct fr flames, it's probably gonna catch fire. Yeah. Um, so then it comes down to, okay, uh, you've got a built environment that already exists. The spacing between the houses is, is fixed. Um, so what can you understand about what is your vulnerability based on how the proximity of one structure to another? And that's what we're trying to figure out right now. There's a four year program where we have burned all kinds of sheds at different distances, and we look at the we look at the flux of how far the flames go from one to another. The, there was a really cool video which you can see in the hall. I shall be I'll man that uh, that computer out there, and I'm gonna I'm not gonna let Jen get away with this one this year. Um, <laughs> uh, but but I can explain there. But but it shows you, and probably by the end of 25, we'll be ready to say something about it. But we know that. 30 feet is good, and we know that 10 feet is terrible. Um, and so we're continuing to refine that based on size of building, based on uh, wind speed, based on the amount of fuel. There's a lot of factors in there, but does that answer your question? Hi, Julie. Hi, Alistair. Thanks so much for being here. Um, it so happened that I was, um, I just got a message from someone from Hawaii Community Foundation. And so thank you for sharing that report because I sent them the link to it. Um, our community, like um, Jennifer's, really was interested in rebuilding back quickly, maybe not necessarily smartly, uh, to the point where there was a pretty big uproar around new building codes. So how, like what strategies um, are you thinking of from a financial perspective to incentivize and help people understand that the upfront costs might be slightly more and it'd be helpful to know how much more that is versus long-term, right? Because now that houses are being built in our community and folks are seeing what their insurance prices are, now they're like, oh, we wish we would have built smarter, not faster. Or I'm, I'm just curious from a financial incentive perspective, what are you guys thinking of? Yeah, so th the nice thing about IBHS is even though we have insurance in our title, we don't talk about insurance much, but I will today. Um, I think the, uh, so the two things, if you are building a, if you're building new, right, and you want to build to the highest level of mitigation that we recommend, 
Um, that will cost you, there's a, there's a report, Headwaters Economics Report on ibhs.org, org. you can look at the, the levels, there's three levels of mitigation. To get to the highest level, um, above 7A, I think it's an additional $3,000. Now the retrofit, what, so if you're building new and there's nothing there on the parcel, then that's what you're looking at. Um, if you're looking at a retrofit perspective, um, we have a, we haven't published this, but this is an internal thing. I, I'll give you some of the assumptions behind it. We took an 1800 square foot house and we said, what if we were to retrofit? And let's make some assumptions that they, they need to do some work on their screens, on the vents, on the soffit vents and the attic vents. Uh, they need to do something with their zero to five, and they need to do something closing in the deck. Um, and so, what would that cost? And under those, under that scenario, you could get away with a minimum of about under two thousand dollars, a little under two thousand dollars. That's if you do all the work yourself, right? Now that cost goes up based on your choice of materials, based on the scope of work, and based on who does the work. So, and those are decisions that you could make. We're gonna talk later this morning, so I'll save it for then, about the, about the pathway to insurability. Um, but I do think that cost in terms of incentivizing it, um, there are two ways of thinking about it. There's one, my insurance should pay for my mitigation. And there's another one where you treat it as a, an investment in the survivability of your house. And, so we'll talk more about that. So one of the ways that, Jen, I'm going to take this one to you, because one of the, because we dealt with the same thing, right? Um, really, we got there. We, I mean, Smart Home got where we were because we had been hit by Hurricane Ivan in 2004, rebuilt quickly, because that's what everybody does, got hit with Katrina 11 months later, right? So everybody had a moment where they were like, oh, we just rebuilt that. That didn't work. Why are we repetitively doing this? Um, and so we just had a group of, and it was insur it was local insurance agents and elected officials that said, there has to be a better way to do this. And that's how we found IBHS and the science was that we went out and looked for it. So I just want to put that in your brain. This research has been going on by every major facility in the United States, every academic institution, every major insurance company has their own research facility. IBHS is tied to all of them. They're 100% funded by the insurance entities. Why? Because insurance wants to know the risk they're going to write because they have to be able to price it because they, they can't go, they can't be in the red. When they write a check to fix your house, they need to have had the algorithm work on how much they were going to collect, right? They're not nonprofits. So, I, and I'm saying this to you because there's this need for state governments to say, we need to research how to build a better house. No, you don't. I mean, like 10 years ago, I may have said, yeah, you probably need to. But no, the, the knowledge is there. Wildfire is getting there quickly, right? They've got, they've got what they know works now, and they're going to continue to refine, continue to refine. And Alistair's right. It is so freaking painful waiting on them to say, we can talk about this now. Why? Because their entire existence is based on, can they write that and know, that they're, know what they're getting? Um, and I'm saying all that to you to say, insurance has to be at the table. The home builders associations have to be at the table. Those two entities, when we walk into any community, are the first two that we put at the table to talk about what is the problem, what are the pain points, where are they willing to start that conversation. Pricing, it has to be in the code so that it's a level pricing. When those homeowners get bids, they need to have something based in that code so that that builder doesn't premium upcharge. They will premium upcharge if it's not part of the base code. That is the model for pricing and bids. So we got it in the code. We put pieces of policy in place so that insurers offer homeowners at renewal a rider or endorsement. So they say, Alistair, it's time to renew your insurance policy. We've got this fortified roof thing. We know it works. If you want it, we can put it on your policy for right now it's about a hundred more dollars a year on your premium. 
But if you lose your roof, we're going to put a fortified roof on for free because it's part of your insurance. That's part of how we went in a couple of years from the 17,000 to 36,000 because after Sally, all those roofs that started getting redone that had that in their insurance policy got a fortified roof. Um, so I think this can be done in wildfire. Wildfire is just so hard because it's so super dynamic and it's so different. Literally, I mean, it can be different from one end of a neighborhood to another end of a neighborhood, right? So it's, it's really hard. And, and for me, honestly, it's very scary to be stepping into this because I know how hard and difficult it is. But I, I think that what we've done can be done um, in wildfire communities, but it, it, it's just, it's a long conversation. I mean, it took us five from start to finish, and this was, we call it persistent engagement. It really just means we nag the hell out of everybody. But we nagged for five solid years to flip our market. Thanks, Julie and Alistair. Um, Brandy Ferguson, I'm representing a Holiday Farm Fire in Oregon. We lost 500 homes and 173,000 acres in uh, one of the 2020 Labor Day fires in Oregon. And um, I'm representing the McKenzie Community Land Trust. Uh, we are a brand new nonprofit that stood up after the fire to help bring back working class family housing and commercial. Commercial is what we found is a big gap in helping our small mom and pops rebuild. Um, we, we're just uh, getting ready to build eight homes this next year. That's a big deal for our little community, one, one particular community that was completely leveled by the fire. We're starting, we're working with our, construct, um, our, our construction um, partners who when I say we want to build back firewise homes, don't know what we're talking about, even just the idea, which is um, a bit disappointing three years after our fire. Uh, we've only got 30% rebuild at this point. So I'm just, you've got a lot of things stirring in my mind about what we can bring back to our community, to our architects, to our construction teams, about how can we rebuild back um, more in a more resilient way, but at the same time as a, a nonprofit, wanting to be an example of firewise rebuilding, how we can do that in a, an affordable way, because we're building working class housing. And um, I'm, I'm appreciating the numbers you're putting on some of these investments. That's really helpful from a fundraising perspective. And like, where do we go for grants? And where do all of these things that um, we're just now tiptoeing into? And so just also wanting to thank Jennifer for you know coming from Oregon to California. Sadly, you guys are all much further along in recovery and we're here to learn from you as well as we're you know just stepping into this so just a lot of lot of pieces there um, not necessarily one particular question but just wanted to put that lens on it as far as how we can be examples for firewise rebuilding um, would be so helpful <coughs> so a um, couple of things and Julie may have some things to add to this too uh, we are engaged with the state of Oregon um, at, at the uh, insurance commissioner level. Um, and so some of the um, legislation that will turn into le uh, regulation is in process that will enable um, things like wildfire prepared home to be available in Oregon. We're, we're trying to get, we're trying to go as fast as we can from California to other states because the demand is there. The need is there. We're trying to meet it. Um, and starting in California, Sounded like a really good idea, and it's really big. <laughs> um, so, and we all are aware of what's happened in the last twelve, the last uh, six months or so in the insurance market. So things have slowed down a little bit. But um, all of the resources uh, about the Wildfire Prepared Home Program are available on wildfireprepared.org. Um, there's technical standards. There's guidance. Um, uh, that's all available. Um, you can contact me, um, and I can. Um, Shepherd, uh, give you access to experts and others uh, as you need. Um, we'd like to support, obviously, we'd like to support anyone that's trying to fight wildfire and mitigate against it. And I would say, just um, let's just exchange cards. We won't necessarily get on a plane and come out to see you, but we can get on a Zoom and just walk you through the strategy of who to bring to the table to get those decisions to sort of be hard baked moving forward which affects your pricing. Um, and so I'm gonna share this, and I'm telling you now, I'm not gonna remember your names, but I'll remember your faces. So if you run off and do this, you'll be in a special place in my head. It's not good. Um, 
one of the reasons we're successful in Alabama is because the insurance industry is the reason we have that grant program, which means that it's their money going into that grant program. And I'm saying this to you because if you if you go with this and wild and run off like you know what you're doing, you will totally screw yourself. Because it is a very delicate conversation. It has not been successfully replicated in other states because insurance doesn't work the same in every state. They may know each other because they're all in the same company, but they don't talk about stuff because they're not allowed to, and they don't share information because they're not allowed to. So there is a way to get the affordability there, but it's there's about seven steps of it, and it can be done. But you can't just call up your insurance commissioner or call like your state farm and go, y'all are paying for this in Alabama, and y'all need to do this here because that is your responsibility. You just killed every effort you had in moving forward. When I say it's a long conversation, it's a long conversation, but I'm also telling you that for the first time in our history in the resilience world, insurance is ready to sit at the table with you, but you, you have to go in very ready to have a very good conversation, but a well-informed conversation. And you have to have the Home Builders Association, not just a home builder, but you have to have your state's organized group of home builders at that table. And you have to have a conversation with them separately from insurance before you bring them both to the table because they hate each other and they stay at war. And if you talk to one of them before the other and they don't know this, you screwed yourself again. So it's a very delicate balance of how you do this, but it can be done and insurance will help you pay for it. If you go off and tell somebody I told you that, again, you will be in a special place. So thank you both for your presentations. Uh, Alistair, this question is for you. With the homes that have been designated or in the process of being designated, um, have you or your team have any information uh, with regards to those homes maintaining their insurance or having the uh, insurance be rewritten because based on the, the certifications that they're getting? Yeah, so we don't get in those conversations with, with homeowners, but what I will tell you is that um, before uh, State Farm and Farmers and Allstate and Travelers restricted uh, availability to their products uh, in California. Several of them had underwriting rules that were worked like this. If you have Wildfire Prepared Home Plus, we'll write you. That was before the, you know, the, the current troubles. So my hope is that once uh, the insurance commissioner and the insurance industry get together and figure this out, the builders, that we would return to a, a, a similar type of framework. It was the insurance industry that requested, demanded from IBHS that we that we start stand up the wildfire prepared home program because they wanted to manage the risk. We can reduce the risk and they can do what they like with pricing. That's up to an individual member company, but they demanded it. Hi, Lindsay Farrell with Nanotech Materials. Um, we're coming here from Houston, Texas. So we're starting to see wildfires be a problem in our state as well. Um, so hopefully, we're gonna learn from you guys and take this messaging back. The thing that really excites me about what y'all spoke of today was, is there a way through IBHS to potentially introduce new products and things that are in testing to help kind of accelerate how quickly we get to this uh, uh, fortified home status and some things that we can do there and tell us more about how we can get engaged. Yeah, so, um IBHS is more concerned about standards than individual products. We, we want to see products that meet the fire resistance standards, um, but we, we're not set up to, do, to be a product tester. There are labs that do that that, that I'm, I'm sure you're aware of. Um, that being said, um, there's a model in California where Cal Fire maintains a list of products that meet the Chapter 7A building code. Um, and so we've been looking at, is there a way that we can kind of add to that uh, because our requirements go beyond 7A? Um, is there a way we can work with CALFAR to, um, to make that information 
uh, available. That's, that's something that's in process. And, and if we figure it out in one state, that might be something that we can replicate um, to others. That and you need to get on TWIA's list of approved. Like you have to you have to be approved by the Texas Department of Insurance and the Texas Windstorm Insurance Underwriting. So, um, yeah, that's it. Those are the two. We'll talk. And Heather's here, although she left the room. Um, Heather's here from um, General Land Office, Texas General Land Office, so she can talk to that too. Hi, I'm Nora Esters. I work in river fire recovery um, in Nevada and Placer counties in California. Um, and we just recently got a contract to do FEMA disaster case management for the winter storms as well. Um, just want to plug Team Rubicon Rebuild. We're hopefully going to host a pilot project for them to build two IBHS um, designated homes um, for river fire survivors. It's not for sure yet, but fingers crossed. Um, and then as far as winter storms, we're seeing homes in Truckee uh, that typically see 12 feet of snow every year, no problem. But we visited homes that are completely gutted inside from water damage from ice dams. Um, and the insurance companies seem to be thrown for a loop. You say ice dam or ice curl to insurance company, they're like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Same with FEMA. Um, so I'm just curious if um, with working on, you know, changing like what you said, going from wind and rain to wildfire, is snow and ice being considered as well? Because our, our community is going from disaster to disaster. It's wildfire season or it's catastrophic winter season. We've had two winters in a row where thousands of homes are damaged. So looking at how do we fortify these homes against fire? and these, these horrible winters we're having? Um, yes, ice dam is a real thing. <laughs> the, um, people don't really understand how, the, how it works with the air circulation and the soffits. And, and, and there is some, we should probably do some kind of uh, illustration of that to, to get the point across. Um, we had the, the sealed roof deck um, that Julie describes of providing that barrier from moisture getting into your attic through the, the, uh, the, through the roof deck works for ice dams too. Um, so if you put in, and in, in some states the building code requires um, membrane um, to, to guard against ice dams. Um, I think there's parts of Colorado that require it. Um, so yes, there is a solution there, and the sealed roof deck is one of the cheapest and most effective um, mitigation actions you can take when you're re-roofing. Um, for a typical sized house, you, the the un, the tape that's required, um, the tape costs like twenty five bucks a roll. So maybe you need maybe you need ten rolls, and then you've got uh, maybe your underlayment costs a little bit more if you get one that's um, synthetic and very uh, uh, will last a long time. Um, but that's that's how you prevent the water getting in. And we talked about Hurricane Sally. I, I, I'm, I haven't seen any claims data from winter weather like this, but if, if the, it stands to reason to me that water getting in through the hurricane or water getting in through melting ice is it's the same thing. Um, you will see a damage, we talk about water being a damage amplifier on a claim. In other words, it amplifies the size of the claim, and that can be as much as eight, nine, ten times. So a little bit of mitigation get, buys you a lot of protection. So I, I extended it a little bit. I'm going to go like another two to three minutes just because there's so much interest and a lot of people want to find you after, so expect to be barraged by more questions. Um, do you think you could just finish out by each of you talking about like, since you know that 50% of the people in here are from wildfire communities, like what can we do to help you achieve your goals, which really also benefit us? It's a big question, but what can we do? That's an easy one. <laughs> Talk about zone zero. Talk about the effectiveness of zone zero. See those videos. Uh, show them to people. Um, it is the it is the most effective form of marketing and advertising for mitigation in wildfire, is to show somebody that this works. Don't wait till a fire, to, so that we can produce a report like the La Hina fire and show what worked and what didn't work. Just show them today. 
show them the videos, bookmark them, have them available, put them on your social media accounts, get the word out. We, we've got to fight the resistance. People don't like change, right? And this is change. So it takes, an, it takes a village, right? And everybody knows more than you do. And they've done it better than you forever. Um, okay, so think about when something bad happens weather-wise and there's insurance claims. No, people do not understand insurance because it's so complicated, so complicated. But one of the things that if you take anything away today is that when you make an insurance claim, you call and say, I have to do this. I've lost this. Insurance puts back your house based on your building code. That is the law. Building code from... 2018 back, 2015 back, is the shittiest way by legal terms you can build a structure. It is legal to build it, and it is not okay. Building code, the premise of building codes is life safety. It's not property protection. We started to see that in the 2015. It got much better in 2018. The 2021 International Residential Code is the first code that truly brings in property protection. The life safety part is that you could escape the structure with your life. That is what the creation of building codes was all about back in the day. By the way, insurance created the building codes way back in the day. Insurance doesn't write in high risk areas because they know that building codes are not enforced consistently, period. So the reason they're moving to things where it's got a, a, somebody is watching the builder roofers do what they're doing and they are certifying that it's done is the future of how things are going to get written in high risk areas. So no matter what you do, you can research all day long and you can do what you think is the best. If the insurance doesn't recognize it, it doesn't matter. You cannot get up at three o'clock in the morning and go pee if you don't have insurance. The whole world functions because we have insurance. So you, you have to meet them somewhere in the middle to figure out what you're doing so that your citizens can have affordable insurance. And state and local governments constantly, God bless them, get in their own way. So you have to help them. Their rules are written before they're hired as a local or state person. They just have to exist with those rules. So you really have to help them figure out how to work around what they're doing or help them make a decision of what they put in place to move forward. And just real quick, let's talk about CDBG and DR. Oh, you want to talk about that real quick. Okay. Real, no, no, I'm just saying because you're going to hear about it from other people. But here's what, we've also, what we also know. States have to decide, and Louisiana right now is the only one that's gone all the way, in that when they put their action plans together, they put it in the action plan, that at least roof is the minimum and that they get points to go to silver or gold. It's got to happen for wildfire prepared as well. We don't know what that's going to look like just yet, but it has to happen. So it can't be we would love to do this. It is this is the minimum period or you don't get a dollar. That is the only way that the state can affect what they look like post-disaster. Louisiana is leading the nation right now, and they will be that star from a win perspective because it is the minimum, and that is all they're building now. And so other states can look at what they've done. We've got all the model wording, legislation, rules, you name it. Um, Texas jumped into this post-Harvey, but, but they didn't know about it until they'd already done everything. And Heather's here. Actually, Heather, raise your hand because I, I called your name, but you weren't in here earlier. Um, it can be done, but for state staff, again, they function under the rules that they have to function under. And so it is very hard for them to just say, hey, boss, we want to do this different. No, we don't know all the rules and stuff, but we just want to do it different. They have to have support in, in making that happen, but it can be done. Okay, and just so you know, I can, I'm making up the time on the other end, so everything is still on time, but I just want to thank both of you. It's really compelling in the combined knowledge, uh, but thank you both so much. I really appreciate it.